Hello Year 5 and welcome to your next reading lesson. So today we're going to picking up the skill of retrieving information, but I'm going to focus specifically on a type of retrieval question, okay? So we're going to be looking at a similar success criteria. So we're also going to be making sure we look out for our keywords in our question and also thinking very carefully about what the question's asking us, which we'll look at in detail today. We need to make sure that we're reading from left to right so we know how to read the books and we need to make sure that we're copying exact quotes from the text when we are retrieving our information, okay? So, before we start... Okay, so, let's have a look at our retrieval practice. What I would like to do is pause the video. Can you please summarise chapter three for me? Okay, well, here is my summary. So let's see if your summary is better than my summary. So Sorrel had decided she was going with Phydrate to the rim of heaven. Slatebeard gave them directions to the valley while Sorrel went to find provisions for the journey. Rat suggested they stop off to see a friend of hers to help them out, find the valley. Rat decided to stay behind as she watched Sorrel and Phydrate set off on their journey. So there are only used about three or four different points to summarise what happened in chapter three. But as you can see, I've only used the key events. I don't need all the additional information in between. But that gives me a little summary of what happens in chapter three. So let's find out what happens at the start of chapter four. So we're going to be looking at some vocabulary that's going to help us with our reading. OK, so on page 20 that you'll see in front of you, it's the very first line of our chapter. It says, oh, pestiferous parasols. Now, four, I mean, pestiferous is the word we're looking at. It's a big word. And fair play to any of you that know this word, because this is a very big, very grown-up word. Now, pestiferous is an adjective, and there are some different definitions depending on how the word is used. But for this particular lesson, we're going to use it in a specific context, which I'm going to explain. So pestiferous, if you are struggling to say it, is four syllables. So pest, if, a, uh, rus. Pestiferous, okay, it's four syllables. And in this context for today, we're going to be defining it as to be annoying or to be a nuisance, okay? I'm going to see if any of you use this when you come back, when we come back to school. I'll be very intrigued to see if you do, so remember it. So let's put it into a sentence. So the pestiferous nephew of yours won't leave me alone, okay? So the annoying nephew of yours or your annoying nephew or that annoying nephew. I might have made a spelling mistake in my sentence. So let's look at some of our synonyms. So we could replace that with annoying. So the annoying nephew, the irritating nephew, the nuisance of a nephew, the exasperating nephew, or the pestering nephew. So any word in there that means that they're being rather annoying or a bit of a nuisance. Now the opposite of this is to not be a nuisance and to not being annoying. So you could be agreeable, you could be manageable, you could be pleasant, you could be very nice, you could be very calm, you could be very friendly. So anything that's going to be the opposite of being a pain, or being annoying or being a nuisance, okay? So I'm going to read the beginning of chapter four. Like I said, if you want to pause the video and read it on your own and skip ahead, that's fine. If not, you can listen to my beautiful voice reading to you along with your paper. So chapter four, a big city and a small human being. Oh, pestiferous parasols, grumbled Sorrel. If we don't find somewhere pretty quick, they'll catch us and put us in the zoo. What's a zoo? asked Firedrake, raising his muzzle from the water. He had landed in the big city an hour ago, and in the darkest part of it, they could find, far from the streets that were full of noise and light, even now when night had fallen. Ever since, he had been swimming from one dirty canal to the next, looking for a place to hide during the day. But, hard as Sorrel strained her cat-like eyes and raised her sensitive nose to the wind, they couldn't find anywhere that was large enough for a dragon and didn't smell of human beings. Everything smelled of human beings here, even the dark water and the rubbish adrift in it. You mean you don't know what a zoo is? Oh, I'll explain later, muttered Sorrel. Although, come to think of it, they're more likely to, to stuff us. Bother! It's going to take me hours to wash this filth off your scales. Fire Drake was swimming like a sl silvery snake in the dirty canal under bridges past the grey walls of buildings. Sorrel kept glancing uneasily at the sky, but there was no sign of the treacherous sun. There, the brownie suddenly whispered, pointing to the tall building. The water of the canal lapped its windowless brick walls. See that hatch? If you make yourself as thin as you can, you might fit through. Swim over there, I'll sniff around a bit. The dragon cautiously let himself drift towards the wall. A large, lonely hatch just above water level gaped open. Its decaying wooden door hung loose from the hinges. 
With one bound, Sorrel jumped off Fire Drake's back, got a handhold on the rough cast wall and put her head through the opening, snuffling. Seems okay, she whispered. There hasn't been a human being in here for years. Nothing but mouse droppings and spiders. Come on. In a flash, she had disappeared into the dark. Fire Drake hauled himself out of the water, shook his scaly body and forced it through the hatch. He looked cautiously around him at this structure, the work of human hands. He had never been inside a building before and he didn't like it. Large wooden crates and rotting cardboard cartons were stacked by the damp walls. Sorrel sniffed everything with interest, but she couldn't pick up the scent of anything edible. Wearily, Fire Drake dropped to the floor in front of the hatch and looked out. This was the first time he had, he had made such a long flight. His wings ached and the city was full of frightening sounds and smells. The dragon sighed. Okay, so let's have a look at some vocabulary for our next page we're going to be looking at. So on page 22, he stared at her incredulously. Now, <laughs> you're probably thinking, Miss Humphrey, you are really mean. Why are you giving us such big words? Well, that's because I think the words we've looked at so far are far too easy. So I picked us a difficult word today. So on this page, we're looking at incredulously. Now, this is an adverb. Okay, we know an adverb describes... Good, it describes a verb. Okay, now this has five syllables. So incredulously. 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 Okay, five syllables. Now, this means to have a manner or be in a manner of disbelief. Okay, so when you're not quite sure what it is that you've actually witnessed or what you're looking at. So let's put it into a sentence. How on earth did you manage that? She cried incredulously. So imagine she'd watched a magic trick. She's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. So let's have a look at our synonyms. So we know synonyms, words that are the same. So how on earth did you manage that? She cried in shock, in disbelief, in pure amazement, incredibly or unbelievably. Okay, so all of those synonyms are words that's going to describe being in a state of shock or in disbelief. Okay, now the antonym is going to be the opposite. So the opposite where you're not shocked by something. Therefore, when something's not a surprise, it's a given. It's okay. You, you knew that that magic trip was coming. You know all the answers. So our antonyms could be likely, could be obvious, it was possible or very convincing. Okay, so that's going to be the opposite of being in shock or in disbelief of someone. Okay, so I'm going to read on to the next two pages. Okay, you can pause the video if you want to read on on your own, or again, you can listen to my beautiful voice. So I'm going to skip back to the page before. She says, What's the matter? Sorrel sat down between his paws. Oh, I see. Who's homesick now? She opened her backpack, took out a handful of mushrooms, and held them under his nose. Here, get a nose full of these. They'll drive the stink of this place out of your nostrils. I expect our friend the rat would like it just fine here, but you and I had better get out as soon as we can. She patted Fire Drake's dirty scales comfortingly. Get some sleep now. I'll have a nap a bit too, and then I'll be off to look for Rat Cousin. Fire Drake nodded. His eyes closed. When he heard Sorrel singing softly to herself, it was almost like being back in his cave. His tired limbs relaxed. Sleep was laying soft, soothing fingers on him when Sorrel suddenly jumped. There's something in here, she hissed. Fire Drake raised his head and looked around. Where? he asked. Behind those crates, whispered Sorrel. You stay here. She crept towards a stack of crates that towered up the ceiling. Fire Drake pricked up his ears. Now he could hear it too. A rustling, a scraping of feet. The dragon raised himself. Come on out, said Sorrel. Come out, whatever you are. For a moment, all was quiet very quiet, except for the noises of the big city drifting in from outside. Come on out, spat Sorrel again, or do I have to fetch you? There was some more rustling and then a human boy crawled out from among the crates. Sorrel retreated in alarm. When the boy rose to his feet, he was a good deal taller than she was. He stared incredulously at the brownie girl, in case he watched her in disbelief. And then he saw the dragon. Fire Drake's scales still shone like silver, in spite of the canal water. In this small space, he seemed enormous. Neck bent, he was gazing down at the boy in astonishment. 
The dragon had never seen a human being at close quarters before. From everything that Rat and Sora had told him, he'd imagine them as looking different. Very different. He doesn't smell of humans at all, Sorrel growled. She had recovered from her fright and was inspecting the boy suspiciously, although from a safe difference. Distant. Now, we looked at suspiciously yesterday, so she's a little bit unsure. So maybe she's pulling this kind of face because she's, she's not quite sure who he is. He stinks of mice, she said. That's why I didn't smell him. Yes, that, that'll be it. The boy took no notice of her. He raised his hand, a bare hand with no fur growing on it, and pointed at Fire Drink. It's a dragon, he whispered. A real live dragon. He gave Fire Drake an uncertain smile. The dragon cautiously stretched his long neck out towards the boy and sniffed. Sorrel was right. He did smell of mouse droppings. But there was something else as well. A strange smell. The same smell that hung in the air outside. The smell of human beings. Of course it's a dragon, said Sorrel crossly. And what are you? The boy turned and looked at her in surprise. Oh, wow! He exclaimed, you're quite something too. Are you an extraterrestrial? Sorrel proudly stroked her silky coat. I am a brownie. Can't you see that? A what? A brownie, repeated Sorrel impatiently. Pfft, typical. You humans may be able to tell a cat from a dog, but that's about all. You look like a giant squirrel, said the boy grinning. Very funny, spat Sorrel. What are you doing here anyway? A little twitch like you isn't usually out and about on his own. A grin vanished from the boy's face as if Sorrel had wiped it 